Hey, hello, this is Colin Haynes, and this is my submission for the design portfolio assignment. So we're going to start off with effort and reward. And this is a sign that can be found at Gator World in Florida. I believe the key demographic for this sign would be children. And children are not going to be willing to invest the effort into reading three paragraphs of block text. Pictures with minimal text would work far better for this demographic. The picture that's used in the sign is insufficient because it fails to adequately show the primary differences between the two types of white gators that are the subject of comparison here. And what that means is that in order to find out the difference, they would actually have to read those three long blocks of text. Uh, the fonts they use are difficult to read, which uh, I don't think is too big of a deal for the, uh, for the title and uh, for these two little subtitles here. But for the block text, I think maybe using a more standardized font would have been a better idea because it's just, it takes a, a lot of effort to read something that long in sort of a zany font. Now the two examples above uh, illustrate a far better effort to reward ratio. The poster to the left uses images that clearly demonstrate some of the key differences between uh, albino and leucistic gators. And children enjoy activities where they could spot the differences between images. So in this example, the effort actually becomes sort of like its own reward. Now if they do find text to be absolutely necessary, uh, the image on the right of the screen shows a much better uh, format than long blocks of text uh, that we saw in the Gator Word poster. Short bullets lists give the reader a perception of little effort to uh, reap the rewards of text when compared with large blocks of text. And having comparison lists next to one another makes it very easy to compare and contrast between the two. And still talking about uh, effort and reward, uh, in the advert on the left, the reader has to do very little work in order to reap a high reward. The tagline of the economy sucks, but your bike doesn't have to, uh, immediately gives the reader the impression that they can have nice parts for their bike at very little cost. The contact information is displayed very prominently at the bottom, so somebody will know right where to go if they need new parts for their bike. The fact that the products are displayed on the bike as opposed to in their raw material form, like you see in a lot of motorcycle parts adverts, uh, this actually makes it a lot easier for the reader to imagine what those parts might look like on their bike. And the dimly lit uh, shop atmosphere gives a working class vibe that makes it feel like the products would be affordable. So it takes a uh, very little effort to read this sign, but the reward is pretty high. You immediately get that reward you're after. Uh, in the poster on the right, the reward is far greater for the maker than the audience. Uh, the teacher is the one that cares more about the rules in this situation. So the reward is actually higher for the teacher than the student who they're supposed to be designing it for. And since the reward is so low, effort should be, have been made to keep the cost down, but this is not the case. The smeared chalk effect in the background makes it really difficult to read in some parts, uh, especially at a distance. And the use of all caps in many places increases the effort as well. And since the audience is most likely elementary school students, a cursive is a very high effort option for them, especially considering it's no longer on the curriculum in a lot of schools. So this one is a pretty high effort and a pretty low reward in terms of its intended audience. So moving on to uh, message. And these are two posters for the same company attempting to convey the exact same message. Uh, the poster on the right is quite probably a more striking image than the poster on the left yet the message is almost entirely lost. In the poster on the left, the message of taking care of fellow soldiers and reaching out to them in their time of need is pretty clear and apparent. And the information on different ways to find help for yourself and for your battle buddies is displayed prominently at the bottom. In the poster on the right, the, uh, the young man is a solitary figure and most of the text indicates that he can do things on his own. Uh, there's a lot of I statements instead of a lot of me and team statements, which is in direct contrast to their message. Uh, it isn't into the very last two lines of the shirt down here that he actually even talks about reaching out. And these lines are not the most prominent. You know, the bigger statements are, are up here. So a lot of people are unlikely to even make it down that far and read that text. Uh, the contact information on this is barely even readable. So even if they do get the message, they might not even think to look down there to get the, uh, to get the contact info. And continuing on the subject of message, uh, the image on the left clearly demonstrates its message in its title. Veterans one-on-one -on -one employment services. Uh, the image of the military hand uh, shaking with the civilian hand reinforces the images of the transitioning service member being given a civilian job. The bulleted list also reinforces the message as to how exactly they will aid the veteran in finding civilian work. Now the message of the image on the right is entirely confused. The reader needs to make a guess as to whether the office is actually collecting cans or if they're giving them out. Uh, the subheading of we are collecting the following items or 
we provide homeless veterans with the following items could help to clear up this message, but it's entirely missing here. And uh, they have the number at the bottom, but the reader isn't given any reason to call that number. Uh, you know, maybe call this number if you have a donation or if you know somebody in need of assistance, call this number. That would help out. But as it stands right now, they have no reason to call the number. So why would they even bother? And also a uh, small detail, but the picture at the bottom has a link to a different, entirely different website, I'm guessing the website where the image was taken from. Um, but if somebody sees that website, that might redirect them towards that, which has nothing to do with the message you're trying to convey. So moving on to picture words and concrete verbs. Uh, the Oreo advert on the left opens up with some very strong concrete verbs telling the reader to open up and take a lick. This creates a seamless mental image for the reader that they can picture themselves doing. It's, it's very easy to imagine yourself licking the Oreo. And the picture beneath reinforces that mental image. And down below you have uh, cream filling and chocolate cookies, which are good picture words. Um, and they, they do give you that mental image of the Oreo itself. Uh, in contrast, the, uh, the Big Mac advert on the right uh, entirely lacks any picture words and concrete verbs. This is, uh, in all likelihood, this is a missed opportunity especially since it stands in stark contrast to the radio adverts I recall as a child. The old little song they had, Two All Beef Patty Special Sauce, Lettuce, Cheese, Tomatoes, All in Sesame Seed Bun, that song was chocked full of picture words, and it almost forced you to build a mental image of a Big Mac in your mind. Uh, yet that mental image is entirely missing in this particular advert. And still on the subject of picture words and concrete verbs, the poster on the left uses two very abstract terms, being union and strong. These concepts do not grant the reader a clear mental image, so the reader is forced to come up with their own image or be left with no mental image altogether. For me personally, when I saw the union and the strong combined with this color scheme and this image, I immediately thought of uh, the old Soviet Union, not so much the uh, California Teachers Association. If the reader doesn't know what CTA is, they might think that stands for Communism for Tennessee Association or something like that. Um, what I really like about the poster on the right is that it takes a very abstract concept, a uh, piece in this instant, and it actually assigns it with uh, the concrete image of a white poppy. So now not only does the reader have a strong mental image for this poster, but they also have a strong image to display on their person if they choose. This poster actually gets them to take the concept from that and apply a, uh, a concrete term uh, or sorry, concrete imagery in the real world. Now moving on to audience. Uh, both of the designs above are targeting the exact same audience through the exact same medium. Uh, both of them are advertisements placed on the back cover of the same comic book uh, in sequence one issue after the other. Uh, both are advertisements for comic book adaptations of uh, very recent, at the time they were published anyway, um, films. Now while both are uh, essentially good designs, the advert on the left does a far better job of catering to its specific audience. The first thing that catches the reader's eye on both designs is the image, which is good since it's a comic book and comic books are a visual medium in and of themselves. Uh, the image on the left is immediately recognizable as a drawing depicting the movie Shaun of the Dead. Now the image in the poster on the right is somewhat recognizable, but taken out of context, if you were to just show this to a handful of people, I highly doubt that very many of them would be able to identify this as an image from War of the Worlds. So not really a great uh, representation in that sense. And the ad on the left favors a prominently displayed tagline that's reminiscent of the film, while the ad on the right prefers a lot of uh, a lot of small text and a large block. And for a highly visual medium, uh, which is what comic books are, this maybe isn't the best way to reach their target audience, and it could actually be off-putting to a lot of readers. Still on the subject of uh, designing for an audience, the flyer on the left was clearly designed to suit the female veteran audience. The red, white, and blue color scheme lends itself to the American theme and is targeting women who proudly serve their country. The silhouettes show a woman transitioning into a soldier, and they're very strong images, yet they're also quite feminine, uh, especially little details like the eyelash protrusions uh, really add sort of a, a feminine element to it. And the contrast between the uh, bold sans serif font and the script font really sort of illustrates that uh, strong and bold, yet also feminine with the script. So I, I think that's a really good contract that helps to enhance the uh, the message and enhance the connection of its intended audience. Uh, the poster on the right, on the other hand, is clearly designed for the maker more so than the audience. The teacher fell into the trap of designing for her or himself. The chalkboard, for one, is becoming an antiquated tool. So this theme is impactful to adults who likely experienced chalkboards during their childhood, but not so much to the children who comprise the intended audience since they have likely dealt with uh, 
whiteboards, if not uh, digital projections their entire lives. Uh, it must also be said that students don't likely care as much about the rules as the teacher and therefore would be unwilling to put much effort into reading this. So things like cursive and all caps that make it more difficult to read means that this audience is less likely to engage in doing so. Now moving on to the subject of embellishment, enhancement, and embodiment. The advert on the left has strong message embodiment and two effective enhancements. Uh, the boy opening and licking while looking completely ecstatic completely sums up uh, the title in one joyous message. The image not only sums up the message, but potentially makes the reader want to partake in the activity themselves after seeing how happy it made this child. The picture of the Oreo packaging and the picture of the Oreo itself enhance the advert as they provide a nice image of exactly what they want the customer to purchase. The advert on the right has an embellishment that uh, serves little purpose other than taking up white space, of which this advert actually has precious little to begin with. And it actually confuses the message of the advert because the motorcycle depicted is clearly not a Triumph, BSA, or Norton. So a person thumbing through the magazine who is looking for parts for that sort of bike uh, is likely to skip past this without ever reading it uh, based on seeing that image that's not the bike they're looking for. So in the case of this British Cycle advert, the embellishment they placed on their advertisement is uh, not great as it actually detracts from their message. And the backdrop of the pamphlet on the left is a good embodiment of their message. Their goal is to help soldiers uh, just life at home and showing a soldier uh, looking elated with his wife and child in a home environment is a grand way of doing so. Conversely, the background of the business card on the right has seemingly nothing to do with its message at all. Uh, the mountains have nothing to do with uh, the barbershop, with hair or hair cutting, or even anything to do with uh, Salem, where the shop is located. I think this backdrop was simply just chosen at random because he thought it looked neat. Now on to proximity. In the Big Mac advert on the left, it's plain to see which Big Mac is which uh, because the titles are placed directly above the hamburger to uh, which they're referring. If the names of the burgers were listed and depicted separately, it would not be as easy to distinguish. Now with the image on the right, I think they did one good thing and one bad thing in terms of proximity. We tend to assume that things in close proximity are the same and ergo they should be grouped together. This works for this poster because we can group all of the images on the left as albino and all the images on the right as leucistic. Uh, likewise, we would tend to believe that the images on the left and right of one another are like for like comparison. Uh, and this is not the case in the first pair at the top. I had naturally assumed since the image on the top left was an albino alligator that the image on the top right would also be a, a lucidic alligator. Um, but that wasn't actually the case. Uh, it actually took me a few glances to even realize that this was a croc and it wasn't in fact a like for like comparison. And still on the subject of proximity, uh, Two pamphlets from uh, Polk County Veterans Service Office where I work, but uh, I will say that none of the Polk County BSO things listed on here are my own designs. But at any rate, uh, at the top of the pamphlet on the left, uh, you see the phrase honoring all who served, and it's surrounded by the emblems of the five branches of service as well as one from the National Guard. Um, and it clearly shows by the all caps and the all that uh, that really they really want that to be the emphasis. And showing all five branches of services and the National Guard in such close proximity to honoring all who served uh, really helps to reinforce that message. So somebody viewing this pamphlet will think, okay, uh, I'm honored because I'm in this branch or this branch or this branch. So in this case, the proximity really works well. As for the image on the right, it might actually make more sense proximity wise if the images were flipped around, um, but it still wouldn't be great. The can beneath the Polk VSO title would tend to make one believe that the image should be associated with the office but that's not what they're going for. A more ideal proximity layout for this pamphlet would be to place the cans close to the word food, uh, place a picture of some toiletries next to the word hygiene, and place a shirt or something of that sort close to the word clothing. But as for the way it's laid out proximity wise, it's difficult to make sense of what's going on here. Now moving on to alignment, uh, the flyer on the left uses different alignment in different places, but each one is consistent throughout, giving the flyer a unified form. I'll just use the middle section of this flyer as an example. The left and middle portions use center alignment, while the right portion uses left align. This actually works in this instance uh, because it's consistent. The centering of the left and middle makes sense because they contain big bold typeface that take up a great deal of real estate. Uh, the right is left aligned because it's smaller typeface and it's text in greater quantities, so the left alignment actually makes it easier to read. Now the advert on the right has very little white space, which already makes it look a bit cluttered and disorganized. And this clutter is made even worse by the misuse of principles of alignment. 
Most of the elements on here are center aligned, or not most, but a lot of the elements are center aligned, but the contact information uh, in the center is not aligned with any other element. At first glance, I actually thought that they might be aligned with the pictures, but uh, you could actually see that that's not really the case here. They're not actually aligned with any other element. They're just sort of confused and misaligned right in the middle. Uh, they just blur into everything else at a cursory glance. And here's the back of two business cards. Uh, one that highlights the services provided by a barber, the other uh, providing tattoo aftercare instructions. Uh, each of the cards has a bullet type list. However, uh, the card on the right chooses a traditionally aligned number list format. And the one on the left chose to carry the center alignment from the title over to the bulleted list. Uh, and in some cases they're using multiple items on one line. In some cases they're not. Uh, this actually would have been a lot more straightforward if they would have done a traditional bullet point list similar to what's seen on the right. Uh, but as it stands there, it's just kind of jumbled there in the middle. And there's definitely enough space on this design to use a more organized uh, bullet style formatting. Now for repetition. The flyer on the left does a good example of repetition through repeating the same symbol throughout. They chose the iconic image of the animal paw to represent the veterinary service. They placed the paw image as a decoration in the four corners, and they also used it as the bullet points throughout. So it really kind of unifies the design as a whole. Uh, on the pamphlet on the right, the uh, one repeating thing I see is the, the bold black bars on either side of the title. I think if this element would have been repeated a third time near the bottom, it would have provided a good stopping point and encouraged the reader's eyes to scan back and forth between the uh, points of emphasis. And in regards to repetition, when the iPod first burst onto the scene, Apple did a really good job of creating repetition through their use of the silhouette using an iPod. In the poster above, the silhouette is repeated four times against different backgrounds. Uh, but the true power of repetition was that it was used widespread and it became immediately recognizable. You would see it on the sides of buses, on the sides of trains, on billboards, in magazines, and wherever you saw it. Because they repeated the image so much, you would immediately know what you were looking at. No need to read anything. And on the right, the repeating element in the podcast cover art is the colors red and white. While this does potentially work fine as a color scheme in general, uh, the overuse of the colors tends to take emphasis away from important elements of the design. The red face mask gets a little bit lost, and the headphones behind them get entirely lost in the backdrop. And I think the headphones and the face mask are two of the more important design elements here that really sort of tie their theme together. So having them not stand out prominently is sort of taking away from their message. It's nice that they're that they continue to repeat the colors, but doing it at the expense of key design elements is less than ideal. Now we're going to stay with the uh, same two images, but we're going to move on to the subject of contrast. The black silhouette of the iPod ad immediately stands out against the fluorescent backdrops and is instantly recognizable. The white iPod and earbuds also create a sharp contest against the black background, which makes the iPod element stand out as well. The sharp contrast of these images is one of the things that made this ad campaign one of the most immediately recognizable adverts of its day. Now with the fourth and too much poster, the red simply does not create enough contrast to make the face mask, which is one of the key design elements, uh, stand out. If this were black, for example, it would stand out against the background and it would give the image the presence it needs. And the same thing could be said for the pair of headphones that sit behind the face mask. The poster to the left is comprised of minimal text and low detail images, yet the level of contrast between the black, white, red, and gray makes everything pop and makes this a very interesting poster sort of a feast for the eyes to look at. Um, contrast that with the image on the right, which is also using a black, white, and gray color scheme with a little bit of red in there. It does have a lot of contrast, yet it's not used appropriately, so no single element of this design stands out from the rest. Uh, it's all sort of blurring together. The image to the right, I think, clearly demonstrates that just because you use high contrast items like black and white doesn't necessarily mean that that contrast is going to make a design easier to read. And now on to color. Uh, the red, white, and blue color scheme in the Oregon Women Veterans poster is quite striking. The posters provide good contrast, but they're not overly gaudy and in your face like many red, white, and blue theme designs can tend to be. The colors are far enough away from each other on the color wheel that they stand apart from one another, yet they don't create any discord. Uh, the poster on the right, however, uses a yellow and green color scheme, and this simply does not work. Uh, the colors yellow and green are too close together on the color wheel, so instead of contrasting, they almost blend together. 
Uh, at worst, some of the elements of this design are almost, if not entirely, unreadable. At best, some of the elements are, you know, light and difficult to read. And still on the subject of the color, uh, the image on the left employs a monochromatic color scheme that uh, works really harmoniously together. The colors are similar, but each is distinct enough to stand apart from the next. And in the picture, uh, the body text right around here doesn't, uh, doesn't look like it stands out all that well, but I think this is mainly due to a glare or flash from my camera. Uh, when you look at the text in real life, it does stand out pretty easily. And the image on the right suffers uh, quite heavily from selecting a font color that's very similar to the background color. For this card to be a little bit more readable, uh, either the font color or the background color needs to change. Now, on the subject of style, these are two contemporary Hot Rod Show posters that are both going for the old school Hot Rod look. The poster on the left accomplishes the look, while the one on the right uh, falls noticeably short. The font choices, the color palette, and the images on the poster to the left all scream old school hot rod. Also, it's not too crisp. Uh, many parts look as though they're actually airbrushed in by hand, which really fits in with, uh, with the styles of the time. Uh, the poster on the right, on the other hand, almost looks like it has a sheen to it. It's far too crisp, uh, so to speak, for that time period. Uh, the way everything is laid out on the poster to the right makes it look a little bit more like a weekly grocery store advert than an old school hot rod poster. The gold leafing in the title is a nice touch, and it's something that would have been used on mid-century hot rods, but it's not something that uh, really would have or could have been done on posters with period technology. And style-wise, uh, these are two posters announcing a recent free comic book day. I think the one on the right is certainly a better looking poster, however the one on the left does a better job of encapsulating the comic book aesthetic. The, uh, the bende dots, the blam effect around the fist, uh, the creative layout of the panels all scream, uh, you know, comic book. Meanwhile, the poster to the right uh, is just a little bit too cartoony. The poster could almost pass for a comic book aesthetic, but the fonts, colors, and drawing styles, uh, they do not mimic what's, what you would see in comic books. Now, moving on to the uh, subject of type. In the business card on the left, several decorative fonts are used, but each is distinct enough to create contrast without bleeding conflict. Uh, the color of each makes these fonts more distinct from one another, as well as from the background. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to pick on my barber one more time. Uh, nice guy, maybe not a great designer. But at any rate, the font used in this design is difficult to read and becomes almost impossible to read against the dark portions of the background. The decorative font works okay for the shop and barber name, but I think it would have benefited from using a more legible font for the contact information, as well as choosing a color that does not blend right into the background image. Um, another thing to point out uh, with the bolded use of font in the shop name and the title name, you can see that even scaling down the font uh, a little bit, uh, you do lose a little bit of detail. Like I noticed there's a distinct loss of detail in the D in uh, Derek versus the D in D. The article to the left is attempting to fill a large area with a title and chose an ultra condensed font to do it. Condensed fonts are difficult to use, especially in long sentences, as the letters and words tend to blur together. The tight spacing of this font makes it intimidating to even attempt reading it. The ultra-packed theme of the title actually continues throughout as there is very little white space and the block text is far too tight in the picture. There is zero breathability there. Just the type in general on this article does not make a person want to read it. But ultra-condensed fonts do have the potential to look good in a design, uh, particularly when it's used on a title that has very few words, such as in the design on the right. The tall condensed font really pops on the design, and the blue lightning bolt in the middle serves not only as an embellishment, but it also helps to break up the two words, since with an ultra-condensed font, uh, words do tend to blur together. After the title, the font changes to a sans serif to make the body text easier to read, and a decorative font is used to create some pop uh, with a few subheadings above art designs. And that is going to do it for my presentation today. Thanks for watching.